Um, my research is about using heart sounds for cardiac risk organization therapy, therapy optimization. So I'm Hongxin Law from the Department of Physiology of Maastricht University. Um, so when you look at this title, you would be wondering what are heart sounds. I believe that my colleague uh, Murdad has given you a brief introduction of the modeling of heart sounds in one day before. Um, so here I would like to briefly reveal the history of heart sound measurements first. So when we think about heart sounds, actually um, what comes into our mind is that uh, we can use our ears and even we can use a tube and one with one end connecting to the chest of the patients and then the other end connecting to our ears and then we can also listen to heart sounds. So actually this reminds me of a patient that I managed when I was rotating in medical school. Um, so the way that that patient discovered the congenital heart disease was that at night, the wife of that patient puts her ears close to the chest of her husband and then suddenly she recognized something unusual. She, she heard something, some murmurs or some noises and then which turned out to be the congenital heart disease. So um, during the very early age of um, heart sound studies, so we mainly use ear and tube to listen to heart sound, and then we use that for diagnosis purpose. And that is already um, over 200 years ago. And then later on, like um, 40, nearly 40 years later, uh, we discovered the um, stethoscope. So as you can see, for the stethoscope, we have two ears which connect to our ears, and then for the end piece, for the end piece here, um, we connect this to the chest of the patient so that we can listen to the patient's heart sounds. So actually, this design has been using for over 150 years until now, uh, over 170 years actually, um, and then we uh, we have the um, digital phonocardiogram machine. Uh, as you can see now, this, this machine is really clumsy. Now this machine is already at the um, British, the Great Britain, Britain British Museum, I, I believe. And then this, this machine was built at the, in the year of 1975. And uh, in the past, in the past decades, we have already seen uh, more portable digital stethoscopes. So as you can see, this is the echo device. So um, you can see two elect, uh, ECG electrodes to measure the ECG. So in the middle, there is a microphone uh, to measure the heart sounds. So we can measure the, both ECG and heart sounds, and then we can analyze to see um, how it can be correlated with the patient's disease status. And also, um, we can put the sensors into to the implantable device. So this is actually very close to the thing that uh, we are developing. So we put the sensor at the at the end or at the tip of the pacing lead, and then we insert this um, pacing lead into the right atrium or the right ventricle of the patient so that we can sense the heart sounds. Um, and of course, um, in the past uh, two to three years, we have always also seen the development of the variable device, which we can, as you can see, um, this device also has uh, ECG electrodes and at the end, at the two ends of the device, and then in the middle you can see an, a microphone for measuring heart sounds. So as you can see, the overall trend for heart sound measurement is that the, 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 the device is becoming more and more mi miniaturized. So actually the application of uh, heart sound measurement has evolved from uh, hospital diagnosis to disease diagnosis to the patient monitoring. Um, but um, after obtaining heart sounds, the next question is how should we interpret heart sounds? We all know that if we, um, if we use a hammer to hit on a table, imagine that you have a table here, so you hit on a table and then you can hear the sounds, which are the vibrations of the tables. And then if it hits the table very heavily, of course you, you can also feel the numbness of your hands, which means that uh, the hammer is also vibrating. So similarly, for the heart, we have four blood hammers that hit on the heart valves as well as the adjacent myocardium, causing the vibrations of not only the valves and the myocardium, but also the blood um, 
blood column, blood, blood mass per se, per se. Um, so all together we call these vibrations heart sounds. As you can see, we have four components of heart sounds because we have four types of valves. T1, T1 is the result of tricuspid valve closure, and one is the result of mitral valve closure. They, they all occur at the end, up at the end of the diastolic, so they belong to the first heart sound. And then we have the P2, which is the result of pulmonary valve closure, and A2, the result of aortic valve closure. Both of them occur at the end of systolic, and they belong to the second heart sound. Of course, we can also classify all these four components by the, uh, by the ventricle that they connect to, so into either the RV connected sounds or the LV connected sound. So in this case, we can relate this, we can relate heart sounds to the CRT, which is basically uh, a way that we use electrical pulse to stimulate the two ventricles in order to make the contraction of the two ventricles synchronous. So this is called the uh, CRT. So as you can imagine, we can use the timing information of the uh, heart sound to guide uh, the CRT assessment. So we can use either the M1 to T1 interval or the A2 to P2 interval. So in this presentation, I will focus on A2 to P2 interval. And of course, we are not the first to come up with this idea. Actually, 85 years ago, there is already a paper published by Warforth and Magolis from the Philadelphia. So they already uh, started to investigate the relationship between the uh, ventricle contraction and the uh, splitting of the first and the second heart sounds in the patient with the uh, bundle branch block. Um, however, in the next 85 years, we haven't seen any experimental, more systemic experimental study which use pacing to vary the uh, timing of the two ventricle and then to confirm the relation of the uh, synchrony of the two ventricle with the splitting of heart sounds. So uh, actually the experiment is what we perform. I will show you some results. So during our animal experiments, we um, perform uh, in pigs and then we put the sensors. As you can see, we put five sensors on the heart, on the left ventricle, right ventricle and the right atrium. But we will focus on the data from only the sensor on the uh, base of the RV. Um, and then during the experiment, we paste the RV, the right ventricle, and LV, the left ventricle, at different time delays so that we can vary the VV delays and how this VV delay, also called as the interventricular dyssynchrony, could be correlated with the uh, heart sound splitting. And during the experiments, we um, record the pressure, volume, electrocardiogram, and heart sounds. But of course, we can listen to the splitting of the heart sounds. But um, then we decided to um, develop our own algorithms for the automatic detection of heart sound splitting. So this shows you how it works. So, um, so in, in the uh, button of the panel A, actually, you can see a raw heart sound. So this is a segment of the second heart sound. You can see it has two components, obviously. But not all heart sounds would look like this, and the splitting is not that obvious. Um, so, for from these heart sounds, um, we slide a wavelet. We slide a very small wave along this signal. So, as you can imagine, that for every millisecond that we slide, we sum up the results, and then so that we can get a curve. This is kind of like the average, uh, averaging of the signal, and then we. We translate, we translate this um, uh, uh, amplitude of the uh, of the sum into the intensity map, intensity map. And so we do this for the frequencies that we are interested in. So as you can see, we are interested in frequency range from 50 to 250 hertz. So we for each frequency we use uh, wavelets to slide along the signal. And then we build the intensity map, map as you can see um, in the uh, panel B. So in panel B, uh, obviously you can see two clouds of signals representing the, um, the uh, two vibrations. And then we use the time interval between the two clouds. Uh, we use the medium time interval between the two clouds as an estimation of the um, splitting. Um, so of course, um, our algorithm needs to be uh, validated. So we validate our um, algorithm in a, in a 
nonlinear transient churn model from the already uh, published paper in the uh, in the year 2003, some, some, something, sometime around that. So we use their model and then um, we built different uh, degrees of the split interval and also we, we um, built different degrees of uh, A2 to P2 amplitude ratio and also we built different degrees of uh, signal to noise ratio. So as you can see um, in the button um, panels, um, our simulated, our algorithm uh, can uh, detect the simulated splitting interval from 10 to up to 70 milliseconds. And then also for different A2 to P2 amplitude ratios, as well as for different signal to noise ratios. So the errors were generally within five milliseconds. So we think that it's uh, already good enough for the automatic, de automatic detection of the splitting interval. Um, so we apply this to our animal experiment data, but before I show you the, um, the uh, summary of all my experimental data, I would like to give you an example of what we observed during the animal experiment. So as you can see, during the animal experiment, we fixed the time that we paced the RV at 150 milliseconds, and then we gradually uh, increased the LV, the time that we paced LV from 50 to 150 and then to 250. This means that we paste the LV first and then simultaneously paste the, um, paste the uh, two ventricles and then we paste the RV first. And then, as you can see, the um, split interval gradually decreased from 43 milliseconds to 31 and then further to um, around uh, 23 milliseconds. So the middle panel show you three examples for the ALV75. So this means the LV is paced earlier by 75 milliseconds and then by the simultaneously, uh, by ventricular simultaneous um, pacing and also the RV preactivation. So this, in this case, uh, the RV is preactivated by uh, 75 milliseconds. So as you can see the ECG and also the, um, the pressure. So blue tracing is the, uh, is the uh, LV pressure, uh, red tracing is the RV pressure and then you can see the heart sounds. And then the first heart sound is very small here and then the second heart sounds. And then, um, we only focus on analyzing the second heart sounds in the red panel. So as you can see, A2 and P2, both of them belong, belong to the um, second heart sounds. So they gradually merged as we changed the VV delays. Um, so this is actually what we expected, but what we did not expect is that we would expect a reverse splitting. And we thought that this is related to the animal model that we use, because as you can see, if we focus on the on the uh, last panel of the middle panels, and then you can see that the LV, the whole heart is actually uh, quite mostly activated with the um, RV only pacing. So uh, yeah, th this is related to animal model. I would also like to play some, um, some sound audios at the end of my um, presentation to see whether you can really differentiate all these different splitting conditions. And then I performed this analysis of the different splitting interval uh, for all the five experiments that we uh, had. Of course, we are performing more experiments nowadays, um, so we would foresee more data. But for the five experiments that we had uh, so far, you can see that from LV preactivated by 50 milliseconds to RV preactivated by 50 milliseconds, actually we can see quite consistent decrease of the um, splitting interval. So we thought that uh, this is a solid finding, and then we, the last question is how would the splitting interval from heart sound be with the gold standard of interventricular desynchrony? So we validate our um, heart sound splitting interval with the uh, interventricular desynchrony. Uh, so this is an indicator that we uh, calculated from the, uh, from the pressure. So the pressure is measured by the catheter that we insured into the ventricles. So it is invasive. So, um, and also think about that the heart sound can be measured and invasively from the chest of the patients. So actually um, we can use a non-invasive indicator to estimate the uh, invasive indicator, which is the goal of our project. So as you can see, the correlation is quite positive and also significant. So this means that we can use heart sounds as an indicator of interventricular desynchrony. Um, so the last question is, how can we use this to guide the CRT therapy? So as I mentioned, CRT therapy is a 
electrical treatment that aims to restore the synchronous mechanical contraction between the LV and RV. Um, so, so far um, for the medical guideline, they recommend to use ECG, uh, especially the QRS duration uh, to select the uh, CRT candidates and also for some um, CRT optimization. So as you can see in this example, in this patient, the um, QRS complex is uh, widened and it's around 146 uh, milliseconds. And then our question is whether we can also use heart cells to, to tell the interventricular desynchrony and then to use it to um, guide the selection of the CRT candidates or to use for CRT optimization. Of course, this is something that we are doing. Um, yeah, and also our idea, of, uh, an even better idea is that whether we can, we can combine the ECG, which represents the electrical desynchrony of the heart, with the heart sounds, which represents the uh, mechanical desynchronies of the heart, to better select the candidates for um, CRT or to optimize CRT after the implantation. Um, so I think these are all the things that I would like to present to share with you. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the fundings from the uh, European Union Horizon 2020 and also my recovery actions. Um, yeah, um, as well as the uh, PIC project. Uh, so thank you for your attention. So if you're interested in this topic, you can just mail me. The floor is open for your questions. Sorry. All right. Um, it seems that I had a bit of an internet problem. Can you? And I've, uh, can I play also uh, the different uh, heart sounds? Go, go. Okay. Check. In the meantime, please, audience, prepare your questions. Raise your hand. Yep. Um, I, I assume that you can uh, see my um, see my phone of heart sounds. Now we play the uh, three heart sounds of different VV delays, different spitting levels to see whether you can really differentiate them. So the first one. Let's see if we can hear them because I had problems before sharing the sound. And depending. Yep. The screen desktop that you've chosen will hear or not hear the sound. Can you hear me? Sorry. I don't think we're hearing anything. Ah, OK. Um... So I learned just before that when you share content in uh, Teams, you need to tick a box that says also share audio, share sound no, as well. No, just forget about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. that's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, just, just forget about it. And uh, we can uh, I can answer the questions if you have. Yeah. Perfect. OK, audience, time to engage with questions. This is the interesting bit where we can raise some discussion or some uh, curiosities or some doubts. Raise your hand, please. Espen. Oh, OK. Yes, a very nice presentation, uh, Hong Xing. Uh, very clear. Very, and of course, I'm a fan of your work following it. Um, and uh, I was you were concentrating on S2 because that's where you saw the splitting, right? Yeah. But I noticed that uh, for S1, it was uh, when you had the left vertical first, uh, it was uh, amplitude was um, was high and it was very broad. Yeah. And then uh, when you had uh, when the RV and the LV was uh, simultaneous. You still had a very high amplitude, but then S1 seemed to be uh, shorter in, in duration. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, when LV was, how was it, uh, uh, last, then it was very, very small. Small, yeah. So, I mean, this, is this consistent? Uh, is there a pattern there that you also could use for the same purpose? Yeah, this is actually a really uh, interesting comment. So um, the reason why you can see different amplitude of the uh, S2, I think, um, I think um, the first reason is because of the splitting, and um, because you also mentioned that when the um, the two intervals, when the two components merge, you can see uh, the, uh, the 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 amplitude of uh, the second R sound is is a little bit higher. I think I can share the slide to you and um, for better. Yeah, yeah. Explanation. That's great. 
So, um, for example, for this one, can you see my slides? Yes. So for this one, when the two components merge, you can see a very obvious increase of the amplitude. Um, I think uh, the uh, the change of amplitude for one reason is because of the uh, splitting, and then the other one is because of the uh, stroke volume. We, we we think because if the stroke volume is increased, and then the um, the pressure in the aorta in the aorta would also increase. So as a result, the uh, the hammer, the blood hammer, will hit. On the on the valves uh, more heavily than uh, in the other cases, so uh, the uh, the, the uh, we think that the S two amplitude is related to these two factors mainly. Yeah, I see. Yeah. 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 But I was just say commenting on S one. They seems to have a. Yeah, yeah, and uh, sorry, and also regarding the S one, actually, um, we think that S one is very very complicated because. <laughs> Especially for short AV delay. So imagine that for short AV delay, you have the atrial contraction. You have the, um, and then very closely followed by the um, ventricle contraction. So atrial contraction means the occurrence, means the onset of the fourth heart sounds. And then later on, we have the ventricle contraction. Ventricle contraction, um, we need to consider the isovolumic contraction, the waves, and then and then later on the closure of the valves. So there are a lot of vibrations which are combined into these very little signals. So we dare not to analyze the uh, S1, but uh, definitely S1 would be more interesting uh, in the future. And yeah. Yeah, OK, I see. Yeah. Thanks. Very good work. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Espen. Any more questions, audience? This is your chance. Three, two, one. Okay, I don't see more. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Last, se last second. Go. Just in time. Thanks, Lo. Very interesting presentation. Um, I know that you're in the process of developing this application for for recording the hard sounds. Do you know when it's going to be available and when we can actually start downloading? Uh, sorry, download what? Uh, to download the the application and start using it. Ah, uh, you mean the uh, KCL app? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's another thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I think you should ask this question to Pablo more, <laughs> and he, he's more in charge of this. And and I will assume that uh, by um, actually I don't know, but um, there are quite a few works to be to be finished here. Um, still, we have some artworks uh, to be finished. Um, but of course, we will we will consider you as the first user of the app uh, as long as we <laughs> release it. Uh, a bit of the spoiler after being on the on the highlight here. Um, we are releasing a public engagement tool where we are offering the possibility to record yourself your heart sounds with your mobile. And the public engagement tool is also meant to recruit people to collect data and try to see whether we can hear these differences that we some of our fellows are investigating on. So that's a bit of a, something that we are hoping to release next spring, uh, where we have been invited to be also to the Venice Biennale to display some of our public engagement material. But then uh, that's uh, a bit too early to, to tell. That's a, it's a spoiler. <laughs> OK, so uh, thank you very much, the right. first user. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. So